Bam! Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Telos of EV live on YouTube. My wife is driving around with the Model 3 today. I know, I'm sorry. You're used to seeing me inside an EV whenever we're doing one of these. So we're back inside, but hey, we still got a flag. Don't look at the iPhone boxes. This is totally an EV stream. But it's good to hear from you all. We've got kind of developing stories. I was somewhat like waiting a little bit because I thought there was going to be this big announcement from Fisker, especially when uh, trading was suddenly halted on their stock. Uh, that was kind of like, whoa, uh, you, you just can't buy or... Um, I don't know if you could sell, but you definitely couldn't buy Fisker stock suddenly. And usually when they pause trading on a particular company, it's because there's some kind of pending announcement. And the announcement basically was that they were being delisted by the New York Stock Exchange. So um, that's never a good sign for your company if you're preventing the public from actually being able to buy it. And then this morning... You know, at any moment, I thought, man, are they about to announce bankruptcy? Are they about to announce a deal? The Reuters report was claiming that Fisker was not able to find a buyer, so they're not getting bought out. They're not going to have a partnership with an existing automaker, which was kind of what the CEO was banking on. At least that's what he was telling people. He was like, okay, we definitely don't have enough cash uh, to maintain business operations, but we're going to try essentially to see if we can get a buyout or something like that um wow that was way more than four questions sunny hi <laughs> hi everybody uh garbear nicholas seems like i haven't seen you in forever i know it's been so long since the last live stream it's been far too long hasn't it um no fisker oceans in the middle of the pacific mahalo hey peter mahalo you out in hawaii we gotta, we gotta hang out. <laughs> Let me come crash at your place. Cybertruck and Aptera and Rivian R2S release is much cooler than this. Uh, it is, but and we can talk about that. But I'm kicking off today's live stream just with the latest info, the latest things um, being talked about in the EV space. Of course, I've done a bunch of videos on Aptera and the Cybertruck. Uh, but if you have specific questions about them or topics you want me to dive further into, feel free to ask. But I talked about already in previous videos kind of the most interesting things about them. Uh, Garbear, I agree with you. I don't think Nissan wanted to inherit a bonfire. Exactly. I try to remind people of that with these EV startups. If you're more of a liability than an asset, you won't necessarily get bought out. And that's part of the reason I think a lot of people are like, oh, this company, they won't go under because they'll get acquired by someone or eventually the market cap will get so low, it'll be so cheap and so easy for someone to just buy them out. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, I, I think that if you're designing a product inherently that is, for one, not high in demand, that's a major problem, but for two, also not profitable to produce, then you don't necessarily have valuable assets to sell off to anybody. And um, it feels like that's kind of the situation Fisker is in, because as of this morning, no, they haven't announced bankruptcy, but we all feel like that's kind of around the corner. Um, but they have, however drastically cut prices uh, in kind of the a very, very weird way. Um, so there's lots of uh, agencies reporting on this. I think the original report was dropped by um, Bloomberg, um, which is a paid thing, so I don't want to look up that. But um, let me pull it up from Electric here. Yeah, they issued statements to the public. Here we go. You can see my screen, I think. I'll put my face on here so we can follow along. Oh, uh, yeah, let me adjust that, too, real quick. So, in a statement with the media, they claimed that they had slashed pretty much every price for the Fisker Ocean trim, no matter which trim, um, to be pretty substantial. Yeah, that's funny. The ticket to midnight. So, here's our new price changes. On the high end, they cut $24,000 off the price, and... Um, which is quite massive. But then on the low end, $14,000, still a huge price cut with a new MSRP of $25,000, which is just insane. 
uh, insane price for a vehicle. In fact, uh, I know there, I, there's absolutely no way these are profitable. I'm guessing that Fisker is basically seeing this as we have a bunch of vehicles in inventory, and if we're about to be declared bankrupt, it's just going to be a huge logistics nightmare to try to take care of all of these cars and house them or move them around or whatever. So they're just trying to clear out inventory as quick as they can. The funny thing is their website is so poorly designed that um, I literally just cannot... Uh, find a way to order them. I've seen these price cuts and they are official and they've been reported on by multiple media outlets, but there's just no way to actually order the car. Uh, they don't have a direct to consumer sales model. So you can't just order one off the website. Their website doesn't even allow, um, you to use the configurator unless you're on a desktop. So you can't, you can't spec out a Fisker Ocean on your phone. You just can't, you have to rely on a dealership. And how do you know which dealerships have Fisker Oceans? you can't really because the website doesn't direct you to any dealerships in particular. Uh, so I guess Facebook marketplace just search for them used. But then when I did that, uh, you don't find them, uh, with the new newly reflected price cuts. I don't think the dealer markups, uh, are going to change much just because the MSRP went down. So it's a very weird situation, but it seems like they're on the brink. They're not going to make it much longer. Mike in the Woods says he really liked the look of Fisker's pickup. Yeah, I think there's something that we should learn and maybe pay attention to when it comes to all of the EV startups that don't make it. I think we should look for similarities so that we know what other red flags to watch out for in the future. So we know Lordstown didn't make it with the all-electric endurance. Um, and uh, Solo EV, which was made by Electra Mechanica, I believe is pronounced. They didn't make it either. And um, now Fisker is likely next. And there's a certain amount of overlap, I think, when it comes to designs not being quite as efficient as possible. Um, either too much complexity or too much recycling of old designs, too much uh, horizontal integration instead of vertical, uh, horizontal manufacturing instead of vertical integration. Uh, where do you service those cars if the economy, if the company goes bankrupt and there are no spare parts? Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, I've seen lots of people online suggesting that Fisker should formally announce that they're going to make all the software and the parts open source. Um, they haven't announced that, but there's lots of people pressuring them to. They're like, hey, you've got a pretty solid car there. I'm sorry that the company didn't work out and um, it's a shame that you weren't able to get the money together. But a lot of people already own Fisker Oceans. And you could let the community kind of come together to try to improve the product if you just agreed to make it all open source before you went under. Um, make all the parts, you know, accessible, whichever parts are left, and the designs, and the, make sure that there's no patents or royalties on any of the design and that kind of thing. Um, I think there's a right way to close up shop, uh, and that would definitely be the way to do it. Just give it back to the community. Otherwise, all of the bugs, all of the problems that you currently have with the Fisker, you're just going to forever have with the Fisker, and there's no going back. Um, so probably dismantled or put into storage. Uh, sorry for spam. You don't have to answer all the questions. I kept thinking of more. That's okay. I like questions. Uh, hi from the country of EVs, Norway. Love your vids, both EVs and tech. Thank you, Snore. Appreciate that. Snore A. Hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, let's see. The resources from those packs could definitely be repurposed for a better EV. Absolutely. That's part of the reason why Aptera is on the top of my list for most interesting, most likely to succeed electric vehicle startup because they have focused like no other on cost cutting and manufacturing efficiency. And I just do not see that with these other startups. I definitely didn't see it with Fisker. They, in my opinion, did not have a particularly captivating product. Um, and that was before I knew about a lot of the software issues that Marquez brought up. Um, yeah, the brand behind Solo is still alive, but it's trying to figure out a profit. I think so, uh, Electra Mechanica got bought out by another EV company that specializes in electric converted uh, trucks and vans. Um, but when I look up Solo EV, the first link is just this new company, LOX, I forget how you pronounce it, LOX or something. Another company just bought them out like a couple days ago. Um, the, but all the Solo EVs they delivered, they had recalled. There was a buyback program, so they bought back all of the Solo EVs, basically. 
Um, but yeah, they weren't able to somehow, which surprises me because I thought the solo EVs were pretty cheap and pretty basic, but yeah, Lucid, I think the only reason they're afloat is because of the sunk cost fallacy. Um, just to give you guys a little bit of perspective, Amazon is the largest shareholder in Rivian at about 16%. So there's a lot of big investment groups that have poured a ton of money into Rivian, and Amazon is the largest at 16%. I think the next largest is T. Rowe Price, which has invested uh, a lot into Rivian. They're at 10% of the company. So 10%, 16%, everybody else is at smaller uh, percentages of Rivian. Lucid is like over 60%. I think they're close to 80% now owned by the Saudis, mostly the Saudi Arabian government. Um, so they are pouring so much money into Lucid and Lucid is losing so much cash, even more than Rivian. And Rivian's situation is not great either, but Lucid's is even worse. Um, they've had demand problems before everybody else had demand problems. Um, so they are so substantially being funded by foreign, you know, oil-backed governments. And I think they're at the point where it would basically just look embarrassing if their investment went under. So they're just going to keep pouring money into this company. And I ref I, I just cannot believe that it's because they think Lucid is going to turn a profit. It just makes no sense. It, it, it could not be more disconnected from reality. The idea that I'm going to put another billion dollars into this company that is literally losing over $200,000 per car sold. Rivian's situation is not great either, for the record, cash-wise. But Rivian loses about $40,000 per vehicle. Okay. Tesla never lost that much per car. Um, even in Tesla's worst quarter, they were losing fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a car. And that's at the worst of the worst of the worst in all of Tesla's history. Their margins at the bottom of the barrel when they were worse than they'd ever been were at negative 17% gross margin. Rivian's more at like negative 40% gross margin. And Lucid's at like negative 200% gross margin. <laughs> they are like insanely, insanely bad when it comes to uh, cash burn versus... Uh, revenue streams. Their production has been much, much slower than they anticipated. They're growing much, much slower than they initially thought. So the idea that someone would come in and dump another billion dollars into them, it's not because they're expecting to get that money back. It's just like some rich billionaire that's in charge of the Saudi investment fund, which is this like trillion dollar fund basically, because it's mostly funded by big oil. They're just like, well, we practically already own this EV company Lucid. They're they're a vast majority stakeholder in the brand. And it would look bad if the company went under after we put all this money into them. So at this point, uh, it makes more sense to just keep pouring in just enough money to keep the company afloat um, just so that we avoid those headlines that say we went bankrupt. That's the only way I can interpret it just because there's no... There's no business model at right at this point with Lucid, I see, where they turn a profit. Um, but maybe maybe we should acknowledge in a lot of the EV uh, startup spaces, maybe you don't need to turn a profit if you got a sugar daddy. <laughs> if you've got the right sugar daddy, you can keep burning money as much as you want because they're just going to artificially keep you afloat. Even if you're not really raking in that much money and you're not a profitable business, uh, you got someone on your back to bail you out okay, all the better to them. I guess people get to keep their jobs. Lucid keeps to gets to keep making products that they like and enjoy. Hopefully the Lucid Gravity does well, but oh my God, the number of vehicles they're going to have to build and radically rethink in order to get to a point where they just break even. Oh, oh my God, it's going to be a huge, huge mess. And again, I don't know how, I don't know if Lucid knows how to make a cheaper car that's profitable. They can't make a hundred thousand dollar car that's profitable. So how is that same company going to turn around and make a $50,000 car profitable? Usually the cheaper car is harder to make profitable, especially if you're not willing to compromise on that much. But, um, Sonny Patel's his best websites to learn more about EV startups or go new or get news besides Twitter. Oof. Um, Twitter is mostly where I get all my stuff. Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, 
there's a lot of people that hate certain news sites because, oh, they're biased. Or they go, I tend to go both ways. I'll try to read websites that are biased for Tesla and biased against Tesla. So Tesla Roddy is very Tesla biased and Electrek is usually anti-Tesla. Um, but honestly, I think Electrek is actually pretty centralist. I see a lot of Tesla fanboys on Twitter that act like Electrek is this ultimate Tesla hater. Most of what I've seen Fred Lambert write is pretty fair and reasonable. Um, there's a few times where I'm like, okay, you're going a little harder than you need to on Tesla, but they're like mostly central, slightly anti-Tesla, but mostly mid. Um, I'm sure there's tons of anti-Tesla websites. That's most websites probably, but you ever look up Alpha Motors? They have some really interesting retro-inspired designs and they have a prototype Wolf EV truck, but nothing concrete. Yeah, actually my brother-in-law, Mike, just texted me yesterday with this announcement for their rear-wheel drive small pickup. But yeah, I've, I've heard of Alpha Motors. And he was like, have you heard of these guys? And I was like, no, but I'd like to learn more. And I was messing around with their website after my brother-in-law texted me about them. And I just think, yeah, there's not much concrete in regards to production. Their designs do not look very aerodynamic, which means fairly inefficient, which means big batteries, which means big expense. Also, they have like 15 different models already announced, which to me just screams complexity and too much money being spent. And it's like, you're, you're, I think they're playing the Nikola game where they like the old fashioned Nikola Badger game, where you show a design, you try to get people into it and then hope that some legacy automaker offers to build the car for you. And then you just collect a design fee, which I don't, I haven't seen this business model work. That's kind of what Fisker did. Fisker opted to outsource their manufacturing for the Fisker Ocean, which was not made by Fisker, but made by Magna, who, if you watch out of spec, you've heard Magna a million times. Um, but it seems like that business model didn't work, either because the product was not all that great or because the uh, manufacturing methods were not scalable or Magna probably wanted to cut and then Fisker had to pay Magna a certain amount to build those vehicles. So it wasn't profitable for Fisker or it wasn't profitable for Magna or both. Who knows? Fred seems more anti-Elon than anti-Tesla. Yes. Thank you, Tony. That's a great way of putting it. I agree with that. Yeah. Alpha DeWolf says I have zero relation to them. <laughs> Would I buy Fisker at 25,000? Uh, probably not, but, um, I could see why a lot of people would be tempted if you're in the market. I'm not in the market for an EV right now. I love my Model 3 and there's practically nothing wrong with it. And I, they told me that LFP battery in it would be a, rated for a million miles. So I want to see if that's true. I want to I want to try to put a million miles in my car, which I understand would probably take decades. Especially when the mileage goes down after I get my Aptera, because I'm going to be driving that most of the time. But um, I do think that someone who's potentially in the market for an EV, there's a lot of decent designs when it comes to the storage capacity. Hey, I like the concept of solar on EVs, and that's something the Fisker Ocean did. $25,000 for an EV that goes over 200 miles on a charge, um, that has decent storage space. I mean, there's some somewhat gimmicky, quirky things about the Fisker, like the, the rear quarter windows fold down. Not just the front and back windows, but the very back windows fold all the way down. That's kind of neat. The display rotates so you can go in portrait mode and landscape. Some people might like that. The design is not my favorite personally, but just if we look at kilowatt hours per dollar, that's honestly what the craziest thing is about some of these price cuts. Um, look at this. The Fisker Ocean Ultra. This car has a 113 kilowatt hour battery pack, okay? That's bigger than the standard range F-150 Lightning battery. And the new MSRP, again, I don't know how you buy them because their website doesn't have any inventory and there's no way to find out which dealerships have Fisker Oceans. So I have no idea how you buy it, but the new starting MSRP for the Ocean Ultra is 35 grand for a vehicle with a 113 kilowatt hour battery. So... Maybe if you're an enthusiast who likes to work on cars and tinker with cars and you just were interested in buying an EV to drive around a little bit, but then you wanted to convert the battery pack into an energy home storage project, that's a pretty screaming deal. Like 113 kilowatt hours for 35 grand. Keep in mind, a Tesla Powerwall, which is like $10,000, has like 
13, 15 kilowatt hours in it. So you're getting like eight or nine power walls for 35 grand. I know they're losing money on that. I wouldn't be surprised if the battery pack in the Fisker Ocean costs more than 35 grand. Um, but uh, that is a running theme I've seen with a lot of EV startups that don't make it is they rely on traditional vehicle designs like SUVs or typical pickup truck designs. And because they're not a legacy automaker, they can't afford to sell a vehicle at a loss for that long. So Lordstown didn't make it, and they relied on kind of a basic-looking traditional pickup truck. Very inefficient design, not aerodynamic, required a huge battery pack, and didn't even go that far. Um, so that basically, the second they entered production, they died. Um, Fisker was in production for a while before, you know, basically running out of cash. Now they're delisted. Now they're applying these massive price cuts. I'm pretty sure they're not doing these price cuts in order to turn a profit. Price cuts this massive on a company that low on cash is basically a sign that they're trying to make logistics easier for when they declare bankruptcy. I think that's the only explanation. Please disagree with me in the chat if you don't think that's it. But um, another Mike says, Hey Drew, do you think the UAE investors are all in on Lucid and thus more apprehensive in investing in Aptera because Aptera is so closely tied to Tesla? I don't really see how Aptera is closely tied to Tesla, but there's definitely a lot of United Arab Emirates investors that are r very, very rich and have a lot of money. So they're probably more interested in more luxury brands like Lucid and Aptera is more of a accessible mass market brand. I know Aptera has tried to get in on the Saudi funds because they have so much um, to give. But I think there's there's more at play here than just logistics. I think they're all in on Lucid for more selfish reasons than practical reasons. I don't think they're investing in Lucid basically because they think they'll get their money back. They've lost so much already and they keep pouring more money into it with no sign of return. Um, Milo Hobo says, when you get your Aptera, I will expect all of your videos to be from inside or standing around your Aptera. Yes, I want to do that too. A lot of people got mad when I did that in the Model 3, but mm, I don't know. Aptera is awesome. I, I would want to film in there too. Uh, those are insane overnight price cuts, especially from a company that is struggling. Speaking of Lordstown, you hear that the CEO bought out the Endurance IP and the respun it into a new company slash name. Yeah, I don't. I did see that, but I don't think it's going anywhere. I, <laughs> he's basically starting from nothing, and uh, the design of the vehicle. I don't think the IP was very valuable in the first place. The Endurance was not a very compelling EV, um, and I don't think he had any way of producing it profitably personally. So, um, Aptera is a very strong supporter of Tesla and closely tied to Sandy. I mean, they've said nice things about Tesla, but so has Lucid. I don't I don't really see what the difference is. The endurance is enduring. Um, Fisker is a disaster, ugly cars, and I don't get what they're doing. Well, I think they're basically looking at the cleanest, fastest way to close up shop. I mean, the Henrik Fisker has tried to do a company like this before. It failed with the Fisker Karma. Now it seems like he's failing with the Fisker Ocean again. He put his wife as the CFO for the company. I don't know why she didn't, didn't seem to have any previous financial management experience, but it seems like just kind of a rich designer guy that really wanted to be an EV company, but just had no expertise on how to mass market a product like that. Maybe he's better off as a designer than a CEO. I don't know. Um, Plump Carton says, honestly, just a very basic electric car would be fire. I'm talking crank windows, manual seats, aux and Bluetooth, only four speakers, manual mirrors, basically nothing but a car. You're kind of describing the Coda EV, and they also didn't make it. I think um, that's something from Tesla that we honestly take for granted and don't, don't think about enough is the fact that it is insanely difficult to turn a car company profitable and it's absurdly even more difficult to make an electric vehicle company uh, profitable just because of the expensive batteries the complications of battery management systems and supply chains it is not easy we're seeing lots of different companies try and fail and i think we should we should learn from these failures and try to look at some things that they did that don't quite work um and try to pay attention to that so that we can learn from it and advise it to other EV startups in the future or at least temper our expectations so that when another startup arises, we go, okay, well, they're trying to do that and this company wasn't able to make it work. So 
But I honestly think, if I'm being honest, I don't think outsourcing manufacturing is a definite guaranteed way to kill your company. Like, I don't think you have to do everything vertically integrated in order to succeed. But I do think that the design of the Fisk Ocean probably played a big role in the company's doom. Because at least I watched a few interview, interviews with Henrik Fisker um, talking about the state of the company. And he said they had a lot of vehicles and in inventory and that they were profitable. He were like, we weren't losing money on these vehicles, which kind of surprised me. I'm not sure if he was fudging the numbers in some way to get to that point. But part of me wondered if they did this thing where they wrote a huge check to Magna, who is the manufacturer for their car. I'm pretty sure Magna did everything. I don't think Fisker really played any role in the manufacturing as far as I'm aware but um they probably wrote this huge check which drained their cash on hand and then quickly started realizing that Magna was you know producing all these cars but if they are not able to sell them then Fisker's not getting enough money back to compensate for that huge loss of cash they had to write to get production up and running so if you're vehicle by design isn't that efficient and requires a huge battery pack and that was always a concern of mine with the Fisker Ocean is like most of the cars they're making have 113 kilowatt hour packs which is massive and yet they're trying to say it's a Model Y competitor and they're trying to boast about oh yeah it's better than a Model Y because it has more range and it's like yeah but it's not like smart range it has more range by just stuffing more batteries in the pack which is expensive and costly and um I don't know, nothing about the vehicle seemed to be simple to manufacture. So they probably thought they were going to have a higher average selling price than they ended up having. And I'm sure the software in the car being buggy and inconsistent. And I, by the way, I watched Fisker Ocean reviews long before the Marquez one. And there were lots of people complaining about the same things Marquez brought up. He was by far not the only one having issues. I watched reviews about 12 volt batteries going bad, software being buggy, um, the ride quality not being great because there was no one pedal driving, um, the software not adjusting for the rotating display. So when you get pretty negative reviews straight out the door, that's going to affect someone's opinion of the brand and the company, especially if it's your first product. Um, so I, I think that part of it did probably come down to the vehicle design. And while it did have a few quirky things going for it, like the solar roof, which didn't really add that much range because it wasn't a very efficient vehicle, or the rotating display or the back windows going down. With all that, nothing about it was particularly exciting. And I think that's a pretty important part when the EV market is so competitive and you know so captivating because we've got Tesla and we've got Ford and GM and Hyundai and Kia and now we got Lucid and Rivian and Aptera. We've got so many companies all trying to enter the market at the same time that if you don't stand out in some way, you kind of get, you know, noised out. Other people are um, bragging about their car more or there's something else that another company is doing that stands out more in some way. If you don't really excel in one particular category very much, you're not going to get a lot of people's attention. Um, and especially with the CCS infrastructure being so bad, I'm sure that didn't help with the sales of the Fisker. It's like, at this money, just buy a Tesla. Um, you're not getting great build quality. You're not getting great range or efficiency anyway. Um, the software's pretty crappy. And it got better over time with the whole Fisker 2.0 update, but it was too late kind of by the time. Um, <laughs> yeah, Fisker looked at Tesla's approach about simplifying complexity and then sprinted in the other direction. Yeah, that's true. Any updates from Tello? Pretty much the last video I did on them is the most recent update. They raised about $5 million in their seed funding, which they said will enable them to build two fully functional prototypes, which they will take around to trade shows and try to win over investors, which Tello's whole concept and pitch is all about micro functionality, bringing back the mini truck which I think is a relatively good idea because there's a lot of demand, in my opinion, for a smaller but practical electric truck, and it allows you to use smaller battery packs. And if you're trying to focus focus on a more mass market vehicle, then trying to be more efficient um, is a good call. They also, Tello has plans to outsource a lot of their manufacturing as well, so we'll see how it goes. I still think 100 kilowatt hours is too big 
for their first vehicle. Um, when I asked the Tello CEO about that, he said, well, we just know a lot of people want a 350 mile range and I want to be able to drive it, drive it to Tahoe from where I live. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I get, it's nice to have more range, but you need to focus on profitability above all else. <laughs> so if you have a small, efficient truck, you can get away with a 80 kilowatt hour pack that goes, you know, 270 miles on a charge. And as long as you have NAX and the supercharger network, that's fine. You can start with that and then work your way up to the longer range versions in the future. But um, off topic, but frankly, isn't the Silverado battery in line cost wise? 65, 70,000. Oh, I'm sure they're not making money on the Silverado. That's why they won't sell it to people. Um, Freak Waka says, yep, as I said, doesn't matter if you have the best product ever, you have to be able to sell it. That's true. I think that's kind of the big problem with the Lucid is they do have an incredible product. It's a very efficient powertrain, uh, very aerodynamic vehicle, super high range, uh, decent build quality, although I've seen a lot of people complain about Lucid build quality. But still, a lot of people love that design. A lot of people love their Lucid Airs, but I know a lot of people that defend Lucid and yet just they cannot afford the vehicle. It's just too dang expensive. Um, so they're a fan of the brand, but they can't afford the product. So a bunch of Lucids are still sitting around on lots waiting for buyers. Um, just trying to make sense of why Steve Fambrod's visits to the Middle East were unsuccessful in inking an investor. I, I genuinely don't know, honestly. I personally am quite shocked that Aptera has not um, well, I should preface that Aptera has also said on the record, if you go back and watch their latest update video, and they should be posting another update video in the next couple days, um, but they have mentioned in, well, the, I don't know if they said it in the update video. No, it was in the Aptera Owners Club interview with both the CEOs. They had Steve Fambro and Chris Anthony together, and uh, Steve from Aptera Owners Club asked them directly. He just said, do you have the funding you need? And he said that they've they've got offers on the table and they're just weighing them across each other. Um, kind of like what Milo is saying. Steve Fambro has been burned by investors exerting control over Aptera. He's careful and protective, which I think is smart because yes, the first Aptera company did fail because too much control got taken over by people that didn't have the best interest for the company or didn't have the know-how to keep it afloat. So they've said in that interview that they have term sheets that have been signed, um, which for the record, term sheets are not signed by the uh, the person asking for investment. Term sheets are usually developed by the investor, uh, the investor, whatever <laughs> you want to pronounce it, which means that Aptera is basically cross-shopping deals right now. Um, they've gotten multiple offers from investors and probably banks, you know, with debt equity and that kind of thing. And they're basically trying to figure out which one is going to make the most amount of sense for them. How much debt do they want to take on versus how much equity in the company do they want to sacrifice? Um, Chris Anthony straight up said in that interview that Steve posted, it's a very good interview, by the way, you guys should watch it if you're curious about Aptera. But Chris Anthony straight up said in that interview, they've gotten offers that they just didn't like the terms on. So they kind of said, you know, thank you very much, but we're going to look elsewhere. So they're very careful about which investor they go with, which I think is a wise decision because you could you could lose out on control of your company very quickly if you're not careful. Um, Man Myth Menace says, I like the rotating screen and trays. The roof actually went black. Streaming is cool. I was going to get the pair. <laughs> Streaming is cool. That's too bad. Yeah, I think they probably spent too much money on prototypes too they i remember had this big event where they unveiled all these different products that they said they would eventually make but i don't know um looking forward to seeing Amter's production intent built in a couple weeks me too me too i'm gonna check them out soon um anyway met uh Ufer at a small organic farm recently who lives in their rv there and rents a truck every five months or so to move into the next farm give me an idea of what to do with the oh you're getting a light ship tony congratulations that's cool. Um, I said the same thing about FSD under your last video about that. It's just too expensive. Yeah. Well, that's a whole different can of worms. But we got a lot of questions from Sonny Patel. I don't know if he's still out there. Look at all this. He bombarded me. I asked the channel members, do you have any questions? He said I don't have to answer all of them. But I want to try. I want to try. 
Okay, he says, if money has, if money was no object and you could have three cars and you had a family, what would be our, your ideal car configuration? Cybertruck, Aptera, Model 3? Ooh, that's a fun question. Ten minutes ago. What was that? Um, okay. I'll do a reaction. No, actually, never mind. It's going to be too complicated. Okay, if money was no object, you could have three cars. And I had a family. So I'd probably want a decent number of seats. I really like the Model X, but it's just too expensive. So if money's no object, probably get a seven-seater Model X just so I can move around the family a lot. Fairly efficient for its size. I like the big windshield. I like that it's a Tesla. I like that it has NACs. Um, R1S would be close, but I would want it to have NACs, and I'd want the charge port to be in the right place. But that vehicle doesn't exist. Um, so that that's cheating. I can't answer it that way. Um, the Cybertruck is cool. I love the look of it, and I think it would be a really great cruiser. I've heard a lot of positive things about the suspension, about how smooth it is. Um, and I love the steer by wire. I've heard so many things about it. I haven't driven one yet. Hopefully soon, by the way, I should be driving a cyber truck. Uh, what's today? In about a week, In about a week. I should have a video out. Um, six seater as captain chairs. Yeah. But then I can't fold down the second row. I like car camping. I like being able to fold down the second row and put a bed in the back. So I would want the seven seater. Um, I don't need the third row all the time, but just when you do need it, it's nice to have. Um, I saw that interview and I love how straightforward Steve's approach was this time around. These investors really don't understand all of Aptera's advantages. I think they do. I think, yeah, I think they've, they've got a few different options in terms of investment and they're just trying, they're, they're probably just in the discussion phase right now. That's all I'll say. Model X for family, Tesla Plaid, or Roadster for fun, and Cybertruck. Oh, that's a good answer from MC. I think if I, yeah, I would do a Model X seven-seater for the family, and then I'd use an Aptera if I'm just driving myself or it's just me and my wife. Um, I just, I love the efficiency. I love the range. I love the solar charging. I love not having to plug it in. I love that it still has NACs. Um, very fun to drive. Honestly, I've been missing it lately and I should be checking out the Aptera again here pretty soon. Um, I'll be going on a trip soon. Hope to check them out. When you get to three kids, they need to get in and quick and easy. <laughs> Who says I'm having three kids? He just said I had a family. That technically just means I could have one kid and be done. I'm at zero at the moment. <laughs> I might not ever get to three. I don't know. At least, uh, how the talks are going with the wife right now. I don't think we're going to get to three kids. But that's another discussion. Uh, but he says three car solution. I don't know if I want three cars. That's a lot of registration and insurance. Um, yeah, I guess a Cybertruck if I had a third vehicle. Um, just for the occasional, I don't know, camping trip or wanting to move something. My wife actually seems more interested in pickup trucks than I do. I'm kind of more of the efficiency guy that's just like, let's let's figure out a vehicle that consumes very little energy per mile. But she just keeps saying like, oh, well, one day it'd be nice to have a vehicle with a bed so that we could, you know, if we needed to move something or if we went camping, we could have a lot more storage and that kind of thing. And I'm always like, no, there's a lot of space in the Model 3. See, we could fit stuff in here. I like getting creative with small cars. Um, my wife is more on the like, yeah, someday, not right now, but someday we'll get a truck or something. Um, and I like the power share. That's, that's something about the cyber truck that would really win me over is being able to power the house from the battery pack. I kind of want that on my next car period. Um, Aptera has talked about doing that, so they might want to do it, but that's a fun question. I kind of hope that someone makes front seats for the Model Y that fold down like in the R2 concept. Yes, uh, Tesla, please. Uh, just build that in straight from the factory. That would be cool. So yeah, if I that's my three-car solution. Model X seven-seater for when I'm picking up my family from the airport or just one day I have more kids and need a better way to move them around. Model X as the people mover, and it's pretty efficient. And I like the design. I like the windshield. I like the yoke. I would choose the new yoke. They improved the yoke, by the way. They upgraded it. So the horn is back in the center and it's more durable now. Cybertruck for utility. 
if I need to do something where I go off road or I need to go camping and I bring a bunch of firewood with me, that kind of thing, or move stuff or, you know, cut down trees, help out. I don't really do that a lot on my property, but my grandparents have a lot of property and they're always maintaining it, cutting down trees. So if I was like helping them out or something, it would be nice to have a truck. And then as a daily driver, yeah, I would choose the Aptera. If I was going on weekend getaway trips with my wife, I'd have thousand mile range and the solar charging and I've got the car play there, which is fun. And I'd have open pilot so I can turn on level two driver assist and I don't have to keep my hands on the wheel. Um, but yeah, that vehicle's not out yet either. So did you notice it's supercharging speed? Steven said it was about 500 miles per hour charging. I don't know. That's, that's not new. They've said that for a while now that Aptera would max out at about 50 kilowatts, which translates to about 500 miles an hour, which is about as fast as my model three currently charges. I think that's plenty fast. And the slower, the Okay, some people online have argued with me about this. So please, if, if you're a battery or a EV charging expert, tell me if I'm wrong with this assumption. Please correct me here if I'm wrong, because I thought I understood this, but some people have said I'm wrong. I don't know if they're right. But Aptera having a lower peak charge speed makes the vehicle cheaper to manufacture because you're not moving as much current or as much power through the DC pins. The battery pack isn't getting as hot because there's less power moving. So by Aptera having a maximum of 50 kilowatts, it's cheaper to assemble a battery management system to intake that kind of current than it would be to make it support, you know, 150 kilowatts or 200 kilowatts. Um, so there's cost advantages, and I think that's part of the reason the Chevy Bolt was so cheap was because it had a peak fast charging speed of 50 kilowatts. That was pretty much the only problem with the Chevy Bolt is it was, you know, it had great range and it was really affordable and it had a decent amount of storage space. The only issue was 50 kilowatts, but I assume that 50 kilowatt charge speed helped with the affordability of the product. So in that same way, I think Aptera maxing out at 50 kilowatts would enable them to save a lot of money on the BMS because it's a lot cheaper and a lot easier to cool battery packs and cables that don't have to accept as much current all at once. And because the Aptera is so efficient, 50 kilowatt translates to about 500 miles an hour, which when I supercharge my Model 3, that's about what I get is about 500, 500, 600-ish miles per hour. Electrical engineer, Aptera doesn't have active water cooling. Yes, would be cheaper. Thank you, Nate. Thank you. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I understood that. Um, so I think 500 miles an hour is plenty fast, personally. Um, that's faster than an F-150 Lightning. <laughs> that's for sure. Uh, F-150 Lightning maxes out at like 150 kilowatts, but it consumes like two miles a kilowatt hour. Um, so the Aptera is five times as efficient with a third of the charge speed, which means, yeah, Aptera would still charge faster than an F-150 Lightning. It would charge about the same speed as a rear-wheel drive Model 3. Definitely won't be as fast as a long-range Tesla, which can hit like a thousand miles an hour, but Aptera has much longer range than those cars because the launch edition goes 400 miles, whereas the long-range Teslas go about 300. So Sure, the charge speed will probably be slower on the Aptera than a long-range Model Y, but you don't have to stop as frequently. So, And the vehicle's overall cheaper, too. So, And it should be good for the battery life. That's a good point. It's good. Just don't go to a full charger that has a line. <laughs> I don't think it'll take that long because the battery's not that big. So, yeah, it only charges at 50 kilowatts, but it's a 45, I think, 45 kilowatt hour pack. So... I don't think the Aptera, even though the, the current is lower than everybody else, I don't think the charging time would be that much longer. We haven't seen a breakdown on the charging curve. That we don't know. But I do know there are 2170 cells that are nickel-based, and they're getting PI builds uh, ready at right now as we speak. They're getting all of the parts shipped together. they got a battery pack from Korea, and they've got the body and carbon coming from Europe. So... They should be able to do DC fast charging testing uh, once they get a few PI builds together. And I hope they do some breakdowns on that um, and the charging curve and everything. But yeah, because the Aptera doesn't have active water cooling, it should be cheaper to manufacture, which helps. 
Um, I can't even imagine having multiple vehicles insurance here. Yeah, I agree. I don't, I don't want a three car solution. Um, I'm maybe on board with a two car solution. <laughs> Aptera at model three, that's most likely that's, those are the two vehicles I actually put down reservations for. Um, I own the model three. I'm waiting on the Aptera, nothing else I've reserved. Um, so I don't, I don't plan on owning three cars. Uh, there's just really no point to it's registration itself is so expensive. Okay. Other questions from Sunny. Do I think Chinese manufacturers like BID will be able to set up factories in Mexico? Or do you think the U S government will block them from bringing cars to us? I don't think they'll block them, but BYD has expressed publicly several times that they have no interest in entering the U.S. market because there's way less tax credits and incentives for them. And the, they've said that the market is more confusing in the U.S. because we got CCS1 and NAX and Chatamo all fighting back and forth. So BYD, for those who didn't know, is the largest electric vehicle manufacturer in the world. They're now outproducing Tesla, not counting hybrids. Even if you ignore their whole hybrid business, they're out producing Tesla and out selling Tesla. I don't think they're as profitable per vehicle, but they have a lot of government backing and government support so they can afford really thin margins. And China has, you know, the most efficient, cheapest, you know, manufacturing in the world. That's why all of our tech is manufactured there. Uh, it's slowly changing over time, but still it's hard to beat the logistics of China's infrastructure. Um, so, I think that's why they can sell the BYD Dolphin. What is it called? Or the Seagull? They have these super cheap cars there that are like $10,000. But you're never going to get that in the US or even in Europe. Uh, because by the time you ship it, the shipping of the vehicle costs like half of what it costs to build the thing. So if you try to build, if you try to buy those cars in Europe and have them imported, they're usually more like fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. Which is still very good. But also the range is like a hundred miles instead of 200 miles so it's not quite equivalent to what we have in the u.s um in the u.s i think people are less open to buying 100 mile range evs but in china because there's so much high population density areas there's a lot of people that will comfortably comfortably live with the 100 mile range now this is what we normally do for live streams trade it's like we we kick off with one topic and then you guys um change the topics and ask around about different things. So if I change the title of the live stream every time we change topics, then it'd be a huge mess. 50 kilowatts is what the leaf tops out at. Mine only peaks at 45 kilowatts, likely because of the increased resistance from degradation. Okay, that's fair. Um, lower power supercharging would aid in longer life, but right, heat is the enemy. That's true. Um, we talked all about Fisker at the very beginning of this live stream. <laughs> So that title is always the topic we kick off with, and then we change change around. Um, designing vehicle mileage and charging times around the human body break every three to four hours, bathroom plus snack. Takes at least 15 minutes and the best design approach for sizing batteries and efficiency. Yeah, I've been, I've been totally happy with my road trip experience. It's honestly made me rethink which Aptera I want after the last big road trip I did. You know, I, I have a pretty low range Tesla relatively. It's one of the lowest range ones they make. It, it's about 250 miles real world range. And I drove like 15, 16 miles with it. Uh, sorry, 15, 16 hours. <laughs> 15, 16 miles. That's not much. I drove, I did an all day road trip with it. And usually every time it was time to stop and charge, I was, I was ready to get out and stretch or get some food anyway. Um, I've done the exact same road trip with a gas car that could go 500 miles on a tank. And yeah, I made good trip time, but it was not more enjoyable. It was definitely more stressful. And you just, I don't know, sitting in a car for five, six hours at a time kind of gets tiring, um, kind of gets old. It doesn't matter how comfortable the seats are. It's like after five or six hours, you're just kind of ready to stand and start moving. It's not good for your body uh, to go that long anyway. My wife was also like feeding me as I was driving. So we were doing some like, you know, cannonball type record stuff where you're trying to make insanely good times. And I, I would like the high range of the Aptera just for the option to do that. Just for like, okay, if we want to do this road trip really, really fast, we can. But is that the kind of thing I want to do every time? I don't know. I haven't, I haven't done a 
long road trip in an Aptera yet. So maybe, I mean, what I remember from sitting in the Gamma prototype was the seats were super comfortable. And maybe I would feel different because, you know, the gas vehicle I did that big road trip in, that was a, a fairly old car. It didn't have adaptive cruise control. It didn't have lane keep or anything like that. With the Aptera, <laughs> yeah, 15, 16 miles. With the Aptera, it would have the open pilot, which would mean I don't even have to keep my hands on the wheel. It can just do the eye tracking and I'd have adaptive cruise control. So I just sit there like this in a much more comfortable seat than the seat from my Hyundai Sonata. And I just sit there and the car does all the work and it drives all the way to my parents' place, which is out of state. And it'd be probably less than 12 hours if there was no stops, which my parents' place is about 800 miles away. So the Aptera might be able to do that without stopping. It's I know they say a thousand miles estimated by the EPA, but that's like a, a mix of city and highway driving. So I'm not assuming it'll actually get a thousand miles of real world range. It'll probably be less than that. Um, but if I do have to stop, I'm, I don't know. The way I think about how highway range would affect the Aptera makes me think it might be exactly the right amount. Like if I left my house at 100% with the Aptera with the biggest battery, it might just about hit 1% or 0% as I arrive at my parents' place. I think it might just be the right distance. Do I need to drive, you know, 12 hours nonstop all the time? No, not really. So that's kind of made me think, yeah, maybe I should go with a lower range Aptera if it means I get it sooner. It might be considering. Um, the main reason I should preface in that video the main reason I was kind of interested in the 1,000 mile range Aptera is I have racked up a lot of referral points with the Aptera referral program, and I I don't really have an interest in owning like five or ten different Apteras. <laughs> so if I am going to get one with my referral points, I should try to get the best one I can just to make it worth it because so many people use my referral code and thank you by the way for those who did. So I would I would want of course it would be a vehicle I review on the channel and if I have access to that many points already um it would make sense to like I'm going to review the best of the best the highest end Aptera and tell you if it's worth it or you know tell you its advantages and disadvantages that way you don't have to buy the high range one. Um, I haven't heard about the Hyundai EV recall. No, they need a physical repair. Well, they will have charging speed and nerf. Yikes. Well, everybody has recalls. Just nobody, nobody's, uh, against the, <laughs> nobody's beyond Mike will take one. We got to figure out a deal for that because I still have to pay taxes on any points I redeem. So yeah, that's if if they scrap the referral program, it probably would change which Aptera I get. But I believe I stated that in my Aptera reservation video. Martin Horak says, on my 1500 mile EV road trip day, I actually walked 22,000 steps. Every time I got out after plugging in, I made a point to walk around. That's a great idea. It's much better for your health and it makes road tripping a lot more doable and enjoyable. Honestly, I, that's something I kind of like about the longer charging stops is that you get to check out the area a little bit. You feel like you're a bit more connected to the places you're traveling through instead of just zooming by them all, which is what I've done. So the other reason I'm okay waiting on the Aptera is because I'm very happy with my Model 3. So I'm not I'm not in a rush. I'm, I'm okay with them getting through a few quarters of production bef so they figure out the quirks and figure out any little manufacturing details that they need to tweak. Um, I'm sure the first few thousand they make, they'll quickly get a lot of data from their accelerators and figure out, oh, okay, this isn't a good design. Let's tweak that. Let's change that. So I'm okay not getting like the first one off the line. Um, only count if they take delivery. Yeah, that's true. The aerodynamics of Aptera really excite me. I'm always disappointed by the range loss at highway speeds. Almost all our main connections around here are interstates. Well, I still expect the Aptera to not get its EPA estimated range, just like how Teslas don't. I mean, most cars don't. But um, just knowing that the Aptera could be 30% off and still get 700 miles on a charge, like, yeah, that's, that's amazing. Um, but yeah, it's, it's cool to think about what things are unlocked and what use cases become possible when you have a car that's 
um, that aerodynamic. I agree with you. So to answer Sonny's question, no, I don't think BYD wants to enter the uh, U.S. market. Okay, next question. Do I think Tesla will ever implement a HUD on the windshield, perhaps on SNX or Cybertruck, or that mess with the whole minimal look of the dash? Some vehicles have a cutout on the dash for the HUD projector. Do you think they could maybe implement it in the roof? Ooh. Um, some people have wanted HUDs. I... I don't feel super confident that they will just because Tesla typically likes to put a lot of data on that driver display more so than just speed. They like having the visualization or your efficiency numbers or the music playing or the navigation. And that might get a little bit busy for a windshield. It's probably cheaper to just have a display back there. Um, so I don't think it's likely that they'll adopt a HUD, but if they reach another point, which I think they're getting pretty close to now, where they run out of demand for the Model S and X and they have to go back to the drawing board again and say, okay, do we stop making these cars or do we figure out what would increase the demand, what would increase the desirability of this? And that might be high on the list for some people. So I won't say it's impossible, but improbable. More likely than anything, you know what I would want on a Model S and X more than anything? Redesign the battery pack. Use some more energy-dense 2170 cells or switch to some higher-density 4680s. I think what would really help separate the Model S and X from the 3 and Y that would make people consider it, especially now that the Model 3 has got the ventilated seats, it's got the rear display, it's got great suspension, great sound isolation. Model 3 and Y are getting better and better. How do we differentiate the Model S and X to make them worth it? High range. I think a bunch of people would be willing to pay top dollar if the Model S and X went 500, 600 miles on a charge instead of, you know, 400 versus 300 like it is now. With the Model X, it's so close to the range of the Model Y. It's like, yeah, there's not that many reasons to go with the Model X over a Y other than the cool doors, slightly larger. But if you could fit, you know, a 120 kilowatt hour pack in those vehicles somehow and still sell them pretty profitably, um, then... I think people would be willing to pay for that, especially if you up the voltage, make them more efficient, switch to an 800 volt architecture, maybe steer by a wire can help free up some space in the chassis and all that. Um, just give it the Cybertruck treatment, <laughs> maybe give them rear wheel steering or something. Um, spice it up a little bit with the, the battery, with the um, efficiency and the charging speed. You know, if we got to the point where the Model S and X could charge at 350 kilowatts, whereas the 3 and Y max out at 250 kilowatts, then I think a lot of people would go, okay, I can justify spending 70, 80, $90,000 on a Model S or X because I'll get way better road trip time with a, a great charging curve and a big old battery pack that can go really far. That's something that Porsche does insanely well um, that I don't think they get enough credit for. Porsche has an amazing charging curve. They just stay pegged at like 250 kilowatts all the way up to like 60%, which just means you can charge that thing like crazy, like no tomorrow. And I wish Tesla would build in some of that crazy Porsche BMS system so that Model S and Xs could pull into any supercharger and be ready to go back out on the road within five minutes instead of 15 or 20 like they do now. Um, that would be cool. What needs to happen to EVs now is the right to repair. Well. Aptera is your answer. <laughs> They're the ones more into it uh, with QR codes on their parts and vehicle panels. Yeah, right to repair and mass introduction of EV conversion shops would be brilliant. I hope I hope Aptera spearheads that. Tony says, Drew, what do you think will occur first? Plaid RoboTaxi fare with no driver or steer by Neuralink demo? Oh, oh. Steer by Neuralink sounds sketch. Um, probably paid robo taxi fare i think there's a very limited geofenced way tesla could launch robo taxis just so they can claim see we're doing it kind of like how the boring company hasn't grown that fast but they technically did make a tunnel in las vegas it's definitely not growing as fast as they initially thought it was gonna like this is gonna solve traffic we're just gonna bore tunnels everywhere now it's been like six years and there's like a mile of tunnel in las vegas or something it's not a lot but um, there technically is, they're technically starting it and they're, you know, practicing and trying to learn how to dig tunnels faster and more efficiently. But when it comes to the robo taxi thing, there's probably a slightly tweaked 
software stack of FSD beta that they could put in a basic Model 3, Model Y right now and just have it operate within San Francisco because that's where most of their miles are and that's where it performs the best typically. So I feel like they could easily just say, okay, we're going to start RoboTaxi beta and launch us. So just like do what Waymo does. Google already has RoboTaxis in a few selective cities with the Waymo system. And Tesla could probably qualify for that same exact program um, if they just tested it a few times and got it approved by the city government. And then you could have not a lot of RoboTaxis, but technically robo taxis that i'm sure would make all the tesla bulls go crazy oh my god it's finally here they said he couldn't do it in reality it's like 15 robo taxis and they're all owned and operated by tesla and whenever the weather's bad tesla has an employee hop in the driver's seat and they're ready to take over at any time so it's not exactly the we flip a switch and then millions of teslas all start ride hailing everywhere it's not going to be as simple as elon said but I could totally see them as a capital raise or as a way to generate hype or to get a bunch of investors excited. Just launch like 15 independent robo taxis within San Francisco and you have, you've got your eyes on them from all your Tesla software employees and they're all ready to take over at any time. But technically there's no one in the driver's seat and you could say, yeah, see, Tesla, they delivered robo taxis. They exist. It's now just a matter of scaling it up. And it's like, yeah, but... It's not exactly what they said, but still, it would it would make some good headlines, I guess, possibly. Um, I personally love the HUD look. The VF8 has one, and it looks great. Simplistic, yet very nice. I haven't driven a lot of cars with HUDs, but I like it more than the driver display idea. One thing that doesn't get talked about enough, have you seen the absolute explosion in PEVs the last couple of years? E-bike, scooters sort of thing? Yeah, I, I follow it a little bit. Aptera Owners Club has reviewed some e-bikes and stuff. But yeah, I th they're cool. Um, I haven't gotten super into it, but I want to get more into it. I don't know. It's just like it gets more and more niche, I guess, when it's smaller range. And maybe that's why people are less interested. It's like, okay, well, if I'm going that short a distance, I could just bike a regular bike or I could just take the bus or, you know. Commuter trains are a better idea than tunnels for cars. It's just hard to monetize and capitalize, though it's better than for people in communities. I think the whole concept with the boring company was that it was substantially cheaper than there was. There were two bids to the Las Vegas City Council for the tunneling project. There was a subway system, which would be the train, just like New York and everybody else has already suggested, or the boring company tunnel. And the boring company tunnel was like a quarter of the price of the train system because the tunnels are very narrow. So you have to displace a lot less dirt than you do for a train system. Um, and the train is most efficient when it's at max capacity. But a lot of the time, that was part of the decision, I think. A lot of the time, the Las Vegas tunneling system is not running at max capacity. In fact, it's barely running at all because... Las Vegas has these big events where suddenly you got to shuttle thousands of people, but then there's huge chunks of the year where hardly anyone's using it, and maybe you move one person an hour. If you're just moving one person an hour, moving around a giant train system isn't very practical. So with the car automated car system, you know during the lower traffic times you just have one vehicle move around, which is way more efficient than the big train. Um, and because you only have to move around a little car, the tunnel can be a lot narrower, so there's a lot less dirt to move around, and you don't have to worry about, you know, air ventilation because you know that they're all going to be electric vehicles. So, yeah, it's it's a big mess. But um, do you think you'd be an e-scooter, e-bike, e-skateboarder, e-unicycle guy? <laughs> e-unicycle, that sounds fun. I've ridden an e-bike. They're, they're kind of cool. As someone who grew up mountain biking, I kind of feel like they're cheating. Um, there's a lot of places it's like, well, if I, if I'm going that close by, I think I'd rather just pedal. Um, it's good for you, uh, to exercise a little bit anyway. Um, so it's weird to kind of try to find this middle ground where, okay, this is too far to go if it's, um, regular bike pedaling too far for that, but not, um, far enough to justify a vehicle. So it's further than a manual bike, further than you could walk. Um, 
but it can't be too far because an e-bike isn't going to have a you know car-like range. You're not going to go 70, 80 miles on an e-bike. So it's in this like different you know level of transportation technique where really short is like okay you can just pedal a normal bike or walk um and then above that you've got e-bikes and e-scooters or e-skateboards and then above that you've got short range evs like uh you know nissan leaf or a uh, arkimoto that kind of thing and then above that you have longer range evs like teslas or chevy bolts that kind of thing um What's funny, what's funny is because of Tesla's freaking referral program and me getting the free supercharging, I'd actually still pay more money to take an e-bike places than my car because my car charges for free. So if I switched to an e-bike, it would cost me more. First, I'd have to buy the e-bike and then I'd have to charge the e-bike and I'd have to charge it from home. And my electricity from home is crazy expensive, so... Ironically, I'm incentivized to not take an e-bike places because of Tesla's referral program, <laughs> which is kind of hilarious. Um, someone was asking about Arkimoto earlier, which I don't think they're quite bankrupt, but they're not really alive at this point either. There's some middle ground. I don't know what they're doing, but um, I do think that in, the Arkimoto concept was interesting. I just think it was far too expensive for what it offered and I would much rather buy an e-bike than an Arkimoto just because e-bikes you can get for under a grand and have close to the same amount of range as an Arkimoto there's very few advantages the Arkimoto had over an e-bike which is I think part of the reason it failed pretty much the only advantage of the Arkimoto is speed so you can take it on freeways but I doubt it's much safer. I don't think the Arkimoto would be substantially safer in a collision. Um, Cause Cyberlift was the last mechanic for Arkimoto and he got laid off. Oh, yeah, they're probably not around much longer. Um, and GoPro, the third most interesting EV company in the world. GoPro? Oh, Go <laughs> Gogoro. Sorry, I need glasses. I didn't read that correctly. Gagoro, so you have a battery swapping system. That makes sense for e-bikes. I like that idea. It makes sense for cities, but I don't live in a big city. I, I'm in a rural area. So for me, it's like I'm either going two miles or I'm going 50. Rarely do I ever have to go like 15 miles, which is kind of the sweet spot for e-bikes. At least your electric cost doesn't cost as much as a massive oil leak on my car. Blew $900 on attempted fixes, but found out it was a $7 part. Ooh. Yikes. Oh, that sounds horrible. I'm sorry to hear that, Plump. Oh, that sounds... Yeah, I do not miss combustion engines. Honestly, I there's been a lot of talk in the EV community about how well they age and how long do they last and e-waste and that kind of thing. And it's making me really interested in this idea of just, you know, financially it's good for me too because we have investment goals that we want to reach. So I'm going to let the out-of-spec channels focus on buying up cars all the time and trading cars and upgrading cars they can focus on that kind of content i want to focus on more car longevity that's more my pace that's more my style i genuinely like i want to drive my model 3 until it dies straight up like i'd be willing to pay for repairs you know control arm failure or infotainment failure uh, stuff like that i'm willing i'm willing to pay for some fixes but i really want to get to the point where that LFP battery just will not turn on anymore. And then I want to find out how much a new LFP battery costs <laughs> because Tesla has never actually quoted it. Um, they've offered LFP batteries to older standard range Model 3s that did not originally have LFP, but if their older 2170 cells start degrading too fast out of warranty, then they offered people, hey, do you want to switch to an LFP battery? You get a little bit worse acceleration, but you get better range and you can charge it to full every day. I would totally do it. Also, I don't have the money. That's true. <laughs> no, it's not so much about not having the money. It's just not a good use of money, um, especially for a guy who works at home. I don't think a guy who works at home should be buying multiple cars all the time. A guy like me should buy one car and hold on to it for decades. That's kind of what I did. And yeah, by the time the LFP battery goes bad... 
how much our LFP battery is going to cost, right? So <laughs> if it's $5,000 to get a whole new battery in the thing, then that's worth it over buying a whole new Tesla. That's not going to be five grand. If Arkhamoto could be sold for $8,000, it would be a big hit. And it, I definitely think that's possible with a competent manufacturer. Yeah, it's too bad that you couldn't find a way to do it. I don't know. I, I think this efficiency in aerodynamics is really the sweet spot because... Well, I mean, for one, I did a whole video explaining how Eptera and Arkhamoto are not really the same at all. They both have three wheels, but that's pretty much the only similarity they have. Um, you know, a Cybertruck and a Model 3 have the same number of wheels. That doesn't make them the same car, right? Uh, Arkhamoto was an uh, open-air cabin, which inherently limits the use case of it a lot. So just like an e-bike, if it's raining out, you probably don't want to take the Arkhamoto. If it's snowing, if it's super cold... Um, or it's super hot, you probably don't want to take the Arkhamoto out because you're not going to have HVAC and you're going to get sunburned if you're pale like me. Um, whereas in a car, I'm not worried is about I'm not worried about that. There's a cabin, it's HVAC, I can precondition the car. Same thing with the Aptera. It's enclosed, you can drive it in the freezing cold, you can drive it in the blazing heat. Sure, your efficiency will take a hit, but you can do it and still be comfortable on the inside. You've got a windshield wiper, all that. Um, but the Arkhamoto, considering the battery pack was fairly small, was still pretty expensive, and the range was not great. You know, it's kind of the same problem. I was watching Aging Wheels did a video on Solo EV, and I was interested in that because I was like, okay, the, the Solo EV, which didn't really make it, they had to buy them all back, and now there's very few of them in existence. But I saw one once at a mall. I think I was with Model Y Mike. Um, we were checking out the Lucid Air at the mall, and then we went upstairs, and there was a Solo EV out on display. And I was like, that's weird. Um, but I was curious about the efficiency because I was like, this is pretty much the closest thing to an Aptera on the market, and it's not very similar, <laughs> but it's the closest thing we have because it was an enclosed cabin, three-wheel design, two in the front, one in the back, and the it was all electric, and the goal behind it was to be more efficient, right? Um, but I looked up the efficiency of it. It had about 100 miles of range with a 17 kilowatt hour battery, which roughly translates to about 5.8 miles per kilowatt hour. Yeah, it was a G3. It's okay. That's pretty good, obviously. That's better than my Model 3, but with a lot of compromises. Um, for one, it was a one-seater. You couldn't even put two people in that car, so... A lot of people complain about the Aptera being a two-seater. Now imagine a one-seater. That that's below, um, that's below the average number of uh, occupants in a vehicle, um, which is about 1.5 these days. So Aptera is above average. Solo was below average. <laughs> Most cars don't have 1.5 seats, so unfortunately you can't be right at average. But um, it was like 5.8 miles per kilowatt hour is pretty good, but considering the compromises and considering how small the vehicle was, I was kind of surprised it wasn't more efficient than that, but I realized it really does come down to the shape. Um, the Solo EV is very small, but still has um, not a great coefficient of drag and still has a lot of harsh angles on the front. It kind of had a more traditional hood shape, whereas the Aptera has this, you know, super tapered, super teardrop shape, whereas the Solo EV was more dropped off, you know, cut off on the back. You know, the only reason there's a, a flat back on the back of the Aptera is purely to fit the license plate. They just needed it to be that little wing on the back, just needed to be thick enough for a motorcycle's license plate. And I think that plays into the efficiency of the design a lot more than people realize. Because um, a Solo EV is not shaped like this. It's it's definitely a bit more boxy. Even though it is three wheels um, and it is pretty small. It's like, okay, the lower weight, the smaller battery pack, and the smaller frontal area can only get you so far. If your coefficient of drag isn't great, then unfortunately you're still not going to get great efficiency. And that's how, honestly, the Solo EV made me appreciate the Aptera even more because I was like, man... So the Aptera has probably five times the storage capacity of a Solo, twice the occupancy with two seats, and still more efficient at 10 miles per kilowatt hour versus 5.8. Um, maybe the real world Aptera is more like nine, 
miles per kilowatt hour, but still, that's amazing. <laughs> Nothing else on the market really like that that's highway capable. Um, the ideal market for Aptera is India, Vietnam, Philippines, tropical Asia. Foxconn has an e-factory in Bangalore. I bet they could make Arkhamotas there for 8000 or less. Mm, I think the App... Oh, you're saying uh, the Arkhamoto market. Yeah, I got you. Honestly, most... I've been to the Philippines. Um, there's more two-wheeled vehicles than three. Uh, most of the rickshaws people are riding around are just motorcycles with little attachments. And I think you could do e-bikes and kind of electric motorcycles there pretty effectively. Um, the cool thing about a lot of places like the Philippines is that uh, there's not a lot of freeways, which means it does directly affect the exterior of vehicle designs quite a bit. You get a lot more smaller, boxier vehicles because the roads aren't that big. And a lot of the time you're weaving between traffic and there's motorcycles everywhere. So cars aren't as big, but they don't have to worry as much about aerodynamics because a lot of them hardly ever exceed 45 miles per hour. And if most of your driving is below 45 miles per hour, you don't need to worry about aerodynamics so much. So you can make vehicle designs a lot more boxy without much uh, range penalty because you're not going that fast. Um, let's see. <laughs> let's play. <laughs> yeah, I've been watching the out of spec towing truck videos too. It's quite quite exciting to see all those big trucks uh, moving stuff around like that. Uh, let's try to see if I can keep up with Sunny Patel. Um, if all goes to plan, how long do you think 1,000 range Aptera will take to come out? Probably 2027. It's the last trim they plan on making. Um, in case you weren't aware, Launch Edition Aptera is going to have a 45 kilowatt hour battery pack using 2170 cells. They've already got a battery, a battery pack manufacturer picked out. Uh, CNET, what are they called? C. So it's a C name. There's too many. They have CPC doing the body, and then they have a, another C company. There's a battery company in South Korea um, that is going to be assembling the battery packs that has already assembled some of the modules that they're, they're going to be used. So the 400-mile range Aptera, 2170 cells. After that, it should be a pretty easy transition to what, in my opinion, is going to be the most popular Aptera trim long-term, the cheapest one. It'll be the standard range Aptera with about 250, 70 miles of range. Um, although they've talked about changing that, I think in the more recent interviews, I think they might go lower because they want to make a super cheap Aptera and it's going to be a crazy small battery pack. I think he was talking in a interview with Kim Java. They said that they would do an Aptera with like a 20 kilowatt hour pack. And all they do is take out a few modules. So right now, I think you can see them in this video I have of the, uh, crash test simulation. As you see, we have a big... There's their frontal crumple zone. Rear crumple zone's even bigger. But yeah, in this simulation of the crash testing that Aptera's showing, these are the battery modules. So there's about six modules in the launch edition that equate to about 45 kilowatt hours. So if you just dropped three of these, that, that comes close to dropping your battery pack costs in half. Um... If you go from 45 kilowatt hours to a little over 20, and then sure, your range is only about 200 miles, but oh my God, battery pack's the most expensive part of the car. If you just cut the battery pack in half and you can still get 200 miles of range, you still have knacks, you can still supercharge. I don't know how cheap they could get that thing, but I think it would be very, very affordable. And it would be the most efficient because it would be the most lightweight. It would probably be under 2,000 pounds. Um, maybe around 1,900 pounds curb weight and capable of charging itself. So it might exceed uh, the 100 watt hours per mile claim. It might be more like 95, 90 watt hours per mile. And then you'd be talking about getting maybe 35, 45, 50 uh, miles of range just from solar. And uh, I think a lot of people out there, see, talking about that option is what tempts me. Because on one hand, I think it would be really cool to be able to drive all the way to my parents' place with a 1,000-mile range Aptera and just be able to say, wow, we didn't have to stop. We got a longer range than a gas vehicle. Like It would just be such a flex you know, to, to the combustion engine industry of like what's possible with EVs to have like a self-powered solar charging car that can go 1,000 miles. That's just insane, and I love that idea. But at the same time, 
talking about an Aptera that only needs like 20 kilowatt hours. Oh, it'd be so lightweight. It'd be so efficient. It'd be so affordable. Probably, I'm trying to figure out. I would guess around $25,000 for a vehicle that fuels itself. Oh, can you imagine? Maybe less. I don't know. Maybe depending on how they design it, how expensive the battery pack is, maybe they could get that Aptera to like $20,000 or $18,000. And that's before incentives. It wouldn't qualify for the federal tax credit, but it might qualify for state incentives and that kind of thing. Factoring in... Um, Oh, factoring in five-year ownership costs of a car that's practically free to drive versus, you know, even a, a Model 3, which you could buy used or assuming you find a used Model 3 or Tesla's next generation vehicle comes out and costs $25,000, it's still not going to be free to charge unless you're a YouTuber like me and maybe get free supercharging. But most people can't do that, right? Um, long term, Tesla's taken away free charging before they could take it away again. And then I'm going to be in a big predicament of, okay, what do I do now? Cause home charging is stupid expensive now. Um, so that second cheaper Aptera they make, I think it will be pretty impressive. Like that's another reason I'm so excited for the Aptera. The launch edition is cool because it just, it's the launch edition. It's existing. It's exciting. That's what they're going to start in, a 400-mile range EV that can charge itself. That's cool. That's really exciting. But then after that, we immediately jump into, okay, all we got to do is take out a few battery modules. Maybe you got to redesign the pack a little bit to make sure it's all structurally sound. But take out a few modules and now make it cheaper. You got like a 200-ish mile range, but you can still take it to a supercharger. You can still... You can basically full charge it overnight with a 110 outlet. Oh, pfft. I didn't even think of that. Uh, you could get maybe like 150 miles of range overnight. So not quite a full charge, but Hey, it's still nickel based. I think, I don't think they're switching to LFP right away. I've, I think Chris Anthony has said on the record that they plan on switching to LFP down the road, but not, not for the first couple of years of production. Um, uh, yeah, I, I would love the idea of flexing on the gas car industry with a thousand mile range, but I also have a hard time not getting excited for that entry level Aptera, which could be in the low twenty thousand dollar price range and then still be able to charge itself. Because you know, a lot of people for a two seater, two door vehicle, it's not going to be the car they drive every day. For a lot of people, it'll be their second car. So if it's your second car, it kind of makes sense that you wouldn't get the highest range, highest price variant because for a lot of people, they might just buy an Aptera purely for, um, I'm just driving a work and back. I just want something that's free slash efficient um, to drive me around town and maybe run some groceries here and there. So for, for that kind of market, you're not taking the Aptera on average. You know, there's some days you drive more, some days you drive none at all if it's a weekend and you just stay home or whatever. But if you're averaging with the Aptera 40 to 50 miles of range per day, 200 miles is, yeah, that's plenty. So overnight, even if you can't solar charge it, which you probably will get at least something out of it, especially if it's more efficient with a smaller battery pack, you just charge the Aptera with the exact same plug as a, you charge your phone, 110 outlet, and get a full charge overnight. Dang, that's crazy. An EV that could fully charge itself overnight with the same outlet as your phone. Wow. That's that's crazy. Um, so I'm excited for that one. And then after the entry-level model, they plan on introducing a new battery cell so they can still keep it to six modules, but it's going to be called a 2190. So it's a little bit taller than the 2170, but it has more energy and the jelly roll and everything. So they just have to pick out a supplier for the 2190, but those cells are in limited production now. Um, just like Rivian having the 4690, sometimes you just go taller. So the 2190 cells should en enable a 600 mile range Aptera, which would be higher price and hopefully better margins on that one. So for some people that want to have more range than a Lucid Air, there you go. And it'll only cost probably what, 40 $5,000 or something like that. So for the same price as a long range Model 3, you could get a 600 mile range EV. Whereas a Lucid with a 500 mile range is only, 
you know, the low, low price of uh, $120,000. Um, so fairly low price, but super high range. And then after the 2190s, they introduce uh, 21120 sales. Uh, and those, they said, would be last, but should enable them to get to about 100 kilowatt hours, which if you're at 10 miles a kilowatt hour, then that's 1,000 miles. Um, I don't know about off-roading in it, though. 200 kilowatt hours is very heavy, but good for work truck. <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty heavy truck, but if you want to do long-distance towing, there's no way around it. You're going to need a big battery pack. You can't aerodynamic your way out of that one. Um, I'm curious to see if the new Aptera has more sound deadening and creaks and squeaks not in it. Can you do one of the new one? Yeah, I'll try when it comes out, but um, I don't think the... PI build is going to be ready by the time I go there next, but I plan on going back all the time as, as much as I can. I've got family down there anyway, so I want to catch up and visit with my family and then also um, check in with Aptera and check out anything that they've got going on. So um, all I can suggest to the people excited for Aptera and hoping for more Aptera updates is try to remain patient. It's, it's not going to happen as quickly as we all like, but I do think they're going to get there. I've not rode in a Cybertruck. Um, I have not had the opportunity to. I've seen them in the wild. I've uh, driven past them, and there was one at a super, uh, my closest supercharger recently had one, and I briefly spoke to the owner, but uh, he was not interested in letting me ride around in it, and that's fair <laughs> because there were a bunch of people all crowding him, so he wasn't going to take people on rides because he was it was a work truck for him he was he was like a traveling uh for it guy or something he was doing he had a bunch of storage and hardware in the bed he was using it for work so um he was not about to just start taking people on rides but next week i should be able to drive one i've got a plan i've got a cyber truck viewer of the channel that has been watching for a long time and he's a cyber truck owner and he said that he's happy to let me drive it so we're planning a little meetup, and I'm. There should be videos on that within the week, hopefully. Um, everyone in the tax bracket for everyone is in the tax bracket for a secondary car. My parents, my oh my god, I can't read. My parents had one car, didn't have reverse. The other had to have water poured on it every time to start. It. What is this about tax brackets for two cars? If you just get really cheap cars, which the Aptera I think might be the cheapest car if you factor in ownership costs especially the longer you own the car the cheaper it is especially considering the solar charging yeah I'd like what mike is saying if they could switch to a sodium ion battery i think lfp is more likely for them just because chris anthony the ceo has a he started a forklift electric forklift company before aptera called flux power and they exclusively use lfp battery modules and I believe they've even talked into some contracts with some LFP battery suppliers in Vietnam or Thailand or somewhere, I forget. But um, I think they do have a roadmap to eventually switch to LFP. I haven't heard about any talks of switching to sodium ion, but we all know LFP is cheaper than nickel-based cells. So if they could get an Aptera into the sub $20,000 range and you get free charging for life... Um, eight to 11,000 miles a year of free energy. And it's an auto cycle. So registration and insurance should be cheaper. Plus it's right to repair. So the repairs shouldn't be as expensive, which usually helps with reducing insurance prices. So I think Aptera is on the cusp of creating like the most cost-effective, practical, highway-capable vehicle. I mean, you're going to be cross-shopping this thing with e-bikes <laughs> or Arkimoto-type cars. Uh, car insurance is too high for a second car. Louisiana, Michigan are the two highest states. Yikes. Well, Aptera should be cheaper to insure, I believe. Um, so to answer Sunny Patel's question, how long until the 1,000 range Aptera will come out? I would say if everything goes well, probably like 2027, 2028. So it could be a while, but I'm not in a hurry. I love my Model 3. And... Because I'm in good contact with the people at Aptera and I have a lot of friends with launch edition models. I actually, there's a guy um, not too far from me. He lives like a couple miles from me. Good friend of mine that 
has a Aptera launch edition on order. So he's not an accelerator, but he would get his probably before me. So I would ha I will have access to the launch editions when they come out, and I'll be able to do videos on them and drive them around. So I don't I don't feel the need to like own one of the first off the line because I'll Aptera will is gladly going to have me back. I'm sure when they have a pretty PI build ready um, to check out. So I think 2027, 2028, if all goes according to plan. And then next question from Sunny Patel. When do I think the next Tesla generation vehicle will come out? I would say probably mid to late 2026. Um, because Elon is saying end of 2025. <laughs> so I'm applying some Elon time to that projection. But we know that they're actively working on it at Giga Texas and that they're spending time on the assembly line right now. Um, I'm very excited about that too, just because I'm all in favor of cheaper, more practical EVs. And uh, I'm always fascinated by cost cutting measures or better efficiency measures and how you make a vehicle affordable, but still desirable. You can't just make it boring like a Chevy Bolt. You know, you got to give it some unique advantages. The Aptera is basically the most fascinating case study of that because it's all about what if you just went all out on aerodynamics? What does that enable? Well, it enables the solar charging. It enables the thousand mile range or it enables a $20,000 car that gets, you know, 10,000 free miles a year. All that kind of stuff gets unlocked because of that exterior design. And I'm like, that's awesome. That's really cool. But uh, Tesla's approach on how to get a car to 25000 I think, is going to have a lot more to do with vertical integration, in-house design controllers, a smaller battery pack, all of, everything being designed by Tesla, um, the 4680 cells or LFP, whatever they end up going with, and uh, their new in-house design powertrain that doesn't require any rare earth materials. So... There's just a lot of cool manufacturing and engineering expertise that's going to go into that car. And I, who knows, I might end up owning one someday. I'm not probably going to be day one, but Tesla's got a referral program that I have benefited from pretty heavily. And I still have this vision in the back of my head because you guys, I'm grateful, by the way, for everybody using my referral code is very generous of you. And I've racked up a lot of referral credits with Tesla. And I have this crazy idea in my head. I don't know for sure if it's going to happen, but I have this idea that Tesla will eventually make a way for you to refer enough people that you could get a free next gen vehicle because it's supposed to cost $25,000. I assume it would cost less than that for Tesla to build. So if they charge 25 grand for it, that would mean it costs them, what, 20000 to build and to manufacture? So if it costs them $20,000 to build and someone like me refers 20, 30 people, if there's some way for me to win a free car through the referral program, I would love to do that. <laughs> I don't know if that's going to happen, but it's just an idea. It's kind of stuck in my head. Uh, yeah, Elon should stop over-promising. I agree. But... I will admit there's a lot of uh, positivity surrounding the latest FSD beta, and it kind of has me wondering, what if I'm wrong? I don't think I'm wrong, but it's cool to entertain the idea of being wrong. And in the past couple years surrounding full self-driving, I haven't seen much evidence suggesting that I could be wrong. With the latest FSD beta builds and Tesla claiming they're going to give away a month of free FSD, I'm starting to think, okay, there's a greater than 0% chance of me being wrong now. I don't know. If this whole robo-taxi thing happens, it's going to be a crazy world we live in. I don't, however, think that it would kill demand for all other cars. That's another flawed Tesla bull concept I hear. A lot of people think, oh my god, if if Tesla cracked the robo-taxi code, if, if Tesla could do that, then no one would buy any other car. Why, why would you buy a car that can't drive itself? And I'm like, eh, I think a lot of people would still, honestly. Even if Tesla hit level three, level four, and you could buy full self-driving, and you could fall asleep in the front seat, or you could summon it across town so the car's driving with nobody in it, I still think those features could exist, and there would still be people that go, ew, that's creepy, that's freaky, I don't like that, let me drive my own car. There's still people that like adventuring and off-roading. I still think there would be demand for Rivians and VWs and Fords. And people would people would still buy from other brands even if Tesla had FSD. 
Um, yeah, Tony says his use of FSD has been very encouraging. It's been very human-like. Yeah, I've, I've heard likewise from many people that are usually very critical towards FSD have suddenly gotten a lot more bullish on it. Um, let's see. I mean, it's definitely not going to have a 600-mile range. What, the Aptera? No, but if it has a real-world 500-mile range and it only and it was less than $50,000, that's insane. To be uh, true FSD is the absolute dream. It would be cool, but again, I don't think it would kill off demand for other brands personally. I think people are overestimating how much that feature matters to people. Um, I think a lot of people would still struggle to justify the cost, even if it was level four personally. People who drive to have fun definitely won't own a level three FSD car. They might own one, but that doesn't mean they'll pay for FSD. And I also think it wouldn't be like a, a, a deal killer. Like, oh, I can't buy a Rivian now. It can't drive itself. It's like, well, maybe for some, maybe some Tesla people, but not everybody. I, I think there would still be a ton of people that would still buy a Rivian. Um, okay, let's see. Other comments. What is your wish list for Tesla software if you had to make one in the next year or so? I hope you make a video on this. I can't recall if you already made one. I think you might have. I think I thought I did. I don't remember what I called it, but actually seeing what Aptera did with their center display, because Aptera interior is, you know, fairly Tesla inspired. It's got one landscape center display in the middle. And after hanging out with the Aptera software team and they showed me some screenshots of the UI for the app and the in the car infotainment and I just loved it. I loved how efficient it was. I loved how practical it was. And I love the way they integrated CarPlay into the system. There's all these CarPlay features that I don't get to take advantage of because the Tesla doesn't have it. And what I've realized more, it really clicked after I test drove the Aptera. Once I drove it around and looked at the software mock-ups they had, it made me realize that the Tesla full self-driving visualization is kind of pointless. Like... If FSD is so good, it's safer than a human, why do you need the visuals? The visuals don't do anything. It's just the, just tell the car to drive. And then if you are driving, what's the point of showing the visuals? Just to show that the car is capable of seeing its surroundings? And like a third of the display is taken up by the visualizations, which when I'm driving is kind of pointless. And then when I'm not driving is also kind of pointless. So... After seeing those mock-ups, oh yeah, the Roadster will definitely not have a 600-mile range, yes. Uh, I'm pretty sure Elon has kind of wink-wink admitted that in a few interviews, saying the range isn't that important. Um, but I would love for Tesla to get rid of the visualization, or at least have an option for me to delete the visualization because most of the time it's kind of pointless. It's it's a cool party trick to just be like, hey, the car on the screen is doing what the car is doing here. Um, for controls when the vehicle's in park, it's fine. But when you're driving, I would much rather CarPlay take up, you know, a decent segment of the display and then HVAC controls would be around it and then your efficiency numbers would be in a little tile. I would just like the little kind of Apple marketing tiles, you know what I mean? Let me find one. I was just editing a video. It's kind of a UI uh, like this, where you know, you'd have one big tile here that's all car, or no, maybe not those. You'd have one tile up here that's CarPlay, and then you'd have HVAC controls and buttons down here, like open the glove box or heat the seat right here. And then over here, I had, I'd have my speedometer and my gear selector. And, uh, you know, it could have a little graphic of the car in motion or whatever. Um, but just your speed, your, and then over here, you could have like your efficiency numbers and it shows your miles per kilowatt hour, um, rather than just like a third of the screen being a visualization, which is not that useful, which is kind of what it is now. So that's by far the highest on my list. Um, I'm predicting the next gen Tesla will not have a built in screen and instead require you to mount your smartphone. <laughs> I bet Tesla would love to do that. Canoe originally wanted to do that. But I think legally there's some issues with it. I don't think you can deliver a car that doesn't have a speedometer installed. You can't you can't expect the I bet they would totally do that if they legally could, but I don't think they legally can. The pineapple leather center console still wish for a bench seat on new cars. 
They said pineapple leather won't make it into production, but I really liked it. I thought that was a cool look. Um, so yeah, CarPlay with a redesigned visualizer would be great. Let's see. I mentioned this on a previous tech member stream, but I worded it per poorly and you had to leave. Do I think the US will get the China-like interior refresh on the Model Y next? Fabric dash, ambient lighting, or do you think the next refresh will go straight to Model Y Juniper, essentially? Will there be a gradual half refresh? Um, your guess is as good as mine. I don't have sources, but I would say it probably will depend on demand because there is a lot of talk about the Juniper refresh and a lot of people seem to have caught on that there's going to be a there's going to be a Model Y refresh. I mean, it's obvious. They're not going to give all these features to the Model 3, which is cheaper, and then never give those features to the Model Y. So, of course, the Model Y has to get ventilated seats, ambient lighting, and the rear display. All of that is coming eventually. It's just a matter of when. Um, but maybe to avoid uh, Osborne or to try to make it feel like there's not a big refresh around the corner. They might just slowly integrate those features, but it'll be based on if they can find buyers. You know, Right now, I think I heard from Troy Tesslike that the Model Y inventory is close to an all-time high. Um, so Tesla's playing some games with these price hikes where they're like, oh, we're going to raise the price. You better order one quick. We're going to do it. And they're like trying to juke everybody out by saying, price hike is coming. Price hike is coming. And they're probably getting data on it right now based on, you know, April 1st is when Model Y price is going up a thousand. So that'd be a good time to remind people about that in the next couple of days. But they're trying to see if that results in a big spike in orders. And if they can keep raising the price and keep moving inventory that way, they will probably keep getting away with it. But if it doesn't work and people just aren't raising the prices, then they'll probably have to you can't tell people you're going to raise the price for a month and then raise it for a day and then go right back to lowering it again. So I think what's more likely is they're going to raise the price on April 1st. Maybe they'll raise it again on May 1st. But over time, if they can't move inventory, then they'll start slowly improving it. Like, do what you said, a little ambient light strip, like what the Chinese Model I got, the fabric uh, dash, uh, economies in the toilet. What can be done? <laughs> yeah, if you can't if you can't lower the prices, you gotta increase the desirability of the product. Or another easy way, Tesla's got tons of demand levers. They just say, "Hey, free FSD." They already kind of did it. Free FSD for a month. That's a thing with the Model Y. If that doesn't work, free FSD for three months. Free FSD for six months. Okay, free FSD for a year. If it really doesn't work and they're really piling up Model Ys and they can't move enough of them, but it, they've got a big refresh around the corner, so they kind of have to move them. Okay, free FSD for life. Free premium connectivity for life. They start really getting competitive with the offerings and be like, oh, whoa, okay, now Tesla's including a $12,000 option for free if I take delivery by this time. That... That helps them out. Same with the premium connectivity. Same with the free supercharging. At the end of the year, they can always pull that again. Get 10,000 miles of free charging or get a year of free charging. They've got a lot of demand levers they can pull. The only two things I check on my Bolt EV screen is the following distance and the range impacts due to climate control, terrain technique, and outside temperature. Yeah, I just... Tesla's... One thing... I've, I've complimented Tesla a lot. I hope you guys remember that. But one thing that has routinely disappointed me ever since I got my Model 3 is the navigation system. It's not good. It constantly routes us on weird roads and places that I would not take. And then there's times where I will end the navigation and restart it and put in the exact same destination. and It'll change its mind. It's just not a very good Tesla navigate. The navigation, like how it routes through maps and stuff is just not very good. And Oftentimes we have to ignore it because it's like, why would you want me to go that way? That That's not faster. And then I'll ignore it. And then once the nav updates, it realizes, oh, wait, the, ro the route you were taking is actually faster. It's like, so you were taking me on a slower route? It just, the nav is very confusing and I miss Apple Maps. Um, but I don't want to mount my phone up there. I don't want to have two screens everywhere. I like having the one screen with the navigation but I would like to be able to put Apple Maps on there, which is just far more accurate at navigating. I would also like a way to manually precondition the battery for fast charging. 
Okay, I'm glad I'm not the only one. Freak Waka says the navigation is so weird. Yeah, <laughs> I'm glad I'm not the only one complaining about that. So it'd be nice to let, just let my phone do the heavy lifting, especially long term, because if I plan on owning this car for decades, you know, potentially 30, 40 years, I don't know if it'll last that long, but I want to find out if it does. Um, then there's going to be so much connectivity and updates and navigation that's going to be hard to keep that car and its infotainment up to spec. So if there was just a simple way for me to power the navigation through my phone, I'm going to upgrade my phone lots more than my car over the years. So I can get, you know, 6G, 7G and have improved Apple Maps data that can all be casted onto the screen instead of expecting the car computer to do all the work. Yeah, manual preconditioning would help out a ton. Preconditioning the LFP battery is pain and suffering. I never see peak charging speeds unless on a roach. I know. There's some third-party accessories, I think, that let you do it, but I'm just... I'm too lazy. I don't want to buy third-party accessories. Like, sexy buttons! And I'm like, I don't want buttons! That's why I bought a Tesla. <laughs> if they really had to dump a lot of Model Ys, the way to go would be bulk deal them to some large corporations, local governments, corporate fleets, those sort of entities. Yeah, that, that could work. I've already seen some fleet buyers for Teslas. When is Tesla going to get 5G? I was kind of surprised they've taken so long, but there has been some reports recently. I think they were hiring 5G technicians or something. There was some report I read yesterday that said Tesla was trying to figure out how to incorporate 5G into their vehicles and their Tesla bots. I hope they find a way to retrofit it in our cars because there's a decent chance that at a decade or two from now, they'll carriers will start shutting down the 4g wavelengths and then the 4g modems in our cars will stop working so um, same thing happened with the early model s's they all had 3g modems and then the 3g network got shut down by all the carriers so you had to pay this extra money to upgrade the infotainment to get it to 4g so i was like yeah you might want to switch your cars to 5g as soon as possible because they're probably going to kill it off eventually um, they should have some way to report why you intervene so you can tell them to change the navigation choices. Yeah, they already do that with FSD when it, you have to take over. You were going to kill me. They should do that with navigation. Report bad nav, bad navigation. I feel like Tesla of all companies should have like the best navigation system because they have all these connected cars on the road. But no, Waze and Apple Maps is still superior. Don't make me want to buy a new car. I just want my Bolt TV. No, I'm all in favor of like, just keep what you got as long as it can. And then when your current car doesn't run anymore, then we can talk about budget and what what's important to you in an EV or if you're willing to go EV. I love how the media go to argument when it comes to Tesla's BYD is catching up. Not no BYD and Tesla have the same goal in working together. Yeah, I I don't have a negative outlook on it. I just think, it should be noted, Tesla is no longer the largest EV maker in the world. And BYD grew really, really fast. Yes, they're both tag teaming, but they also compete a lot in China. So it says something that Tesla's not number one anymore. That's all I'm saying. Um, showing battery temperature maybe also would be cool to do from Tesla, but maybe they think that would be too complicated. Yeah, Tesla likes everything to be simple and clean and you don't think about it you know to precondition the battery you have to plug in a supercharger the navigation and be driving to it and it's like yeah okay they want it to be all seamless which is good for mass adoption but sometimes there's nerds like you and me that are like no i want to see all that data i would like to know what my powertrain temperature is i would like to know what the battery temperature is and i'd like the just a nerd mode would be cool just like Rivian has a nerd mode with all the stats come out on the screen and you get your pitch and your roll and all the individual motor temperatures and your regen and all that. I would love that on a Model 3 where it just gives you all the data. You just bought stock in BYD. Wow. Congrats, Jeff. I understand OEMs don't want Apple to have access to their infotainment data, but people should be able to airplay Apple Maps from their phones without the two systems talking to each other. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they can't. Apple doesn't see much data when you do CarPlay anyway. So um, there's a there's a great way to implement CarPlay. And I think Aptera has showcased it. I, all the software I've seen from Aptera has showcased like a really intelligent way of giving all of the car controls a, a well-designed, simple UI while also making space in the UI for CarPlay or Android Auto. I think that's... A, honestly... Before I saw that, it was one of my biggest concerns with Aptera. I was seeing Fisker 
Fisker Ocean, see, it's full circle. It's, we can still keep it in the title. Fisker Ocean had all of these software bugs and Lucid had all of these software bugs and it was just a common criticism for all of these EV startups that they couldn't afford good software teams and they didn't know how to have a reliable, steady software experience. And I was like, you know, Aptera is a very small company, which is good for their finances because it means their cash burn is quite low. But one downside of that is they're probably not going to have a great software experience. I mean, the car is cool and I'd be willing to put up with crappy software just because I want the solar charging and I want the extreme efficiency. So I'll put up with some clunky software. But then when I went to the company and realized how much time and attention they are putting into their software, it just made me an even bigger Aptera fan. I was like, oh, not only do you guys have decent software, you actually have like one of the best UIs I've ever seen in a car because you found a way to wisely and intelligently incorporate CarPlay while still having a good customizable user interface and having an app and um, I'll show you their app they teased in their last update video. It was cool. I'm going to play around with this app all the time. So right from the beginning, you've got your lock button. You can open the doors from the app, both doors. In the Tesla, you can only open the driver's side door. And because they're spring-loaded, I think they might open all the way. I'm not sure if that's going to make it into production. But yeah, you can vent the windows. You've got light options. You can honk the horn. You can open the hatch all from there. And then it shows you right beneath that how much energy uh, you've collected from the sun, how much you're currently generating, and how many miles that translates to since you parked. And then you've got the HVAC button, which is a nice big button, which that's pretty much the one I'm always activating. Um, and then you can select, oh yeah, the fan speed and the temperature with these two little tiles. You can circulate the air. Um, it looks beautiful. It looks very clean, very simple. Battery percentage over time. Tesla's app doesn't really show that, but it shows the slow trickle charge of coming in. And then over the course of the month, how much energy you're bringing in from the solar panels. And you can schedule the charge rate, your charging history, if you're supercharging. It just looks beautiful. Everything about it is just gorgeous. And that continues on to the main uh, infotainment, by the way. Here's the closest thing. Um, I have to that when they come in here they show your solar energy generation all the vehicle controls you're now playing music your HVAC and then up in the top left corner you see the CarPlay icon so you just tap that and boom CarPlay takes over the screen super cool uh, I think I have maybe in here where's my b-roll there's a frame of me checking out the UI. Ah, I think it's in here. Yes, look at this. See how the CarPlay takes up most of the screen but still gives you all of the controls off to the left? It looks so well integrated, like it looks perfect. It looks so sloppy in the Lucid, you know. In the Lucid, it's like tacked on and the screen is like the wrong shape for the UI. But the UI was like with the curved corners and the tile design and everything. Ugh. There, it's got the HVAC controls, all the vents coming out. Also, by the way, the Aptera interior has manual ways to guide the HVAC. So you don't have to... Uh, pull up the display like you do in a Tesla to redirect the airflow. It still has little dials and little fan blades that you can adjust with your fingers. It's an analog way to adjust the flow speed, uh, the flow direction. What are your thoughts on this new wave of YouTubers getting access to tour the Aptera facility? This seems deliberate and the fully charged San Diego convention has been postponed. Coincidence? I just think they're a very uh, open door company. They just seem very honest and it's the first company I've ever worked with where the CEO is willing to just talk both on the record and off the record. We talked for probably close to an hour after we stopped recording the factory tour. And it was amazing, honestly, just getting to know him and figuring out like what his priorities are and why they're doing what they're doing and why efficiency matters to them. And it was just such a passionate story. And like... They're very down to earth, which is, I think, the reason I've become such a huge Aptera fan is like, 
by the end, he was, you know, he wasn't just answering my questions. He was answering my wife's questions. My uncle joined me just as a last second tag along. And he was happy to answer my uncle's questions. The CEO was happy to answer my wife's questions, my uncle's questions. We all hugged by the end. Like by the time we said goodbye, he literally gave us all a big hug. And we said, okay, well, we're excited for you. Thank you for everything you do. And it was just like, we just felt like friends by the end of it. <laughs> and it doesn't surprise me at all that Aptera is willing to let so many YouTubers check out their facility because they, just like me, are kind of perplexed. Why aren't more people doing this? I'm surprised Aptera is the only company trying to make a solar-powered, you know, super aerodynamic company. I feel like this whole three-wheel teardrop shape, this this product design should be a segment, in my opinion. Like, it should be a lot more than one company coming up with cars like this. Um, there could be a different company that uh, designs it a little differently. Maybe it has four wheels, but it still follows that kind of teardrop shape or maximizes the solar surface area. Or it could be another company that has a similar shape, but tries to make it more premium. So they make a more expensive variant. It's more luxurious. It has air suspension and titanium and, you know, I don't know, just fancier materials that are used or something instead of a mass market one. I don't know. I just, I'm shocked that this isn't more people aren't going after this um it feels dangerous watching drew's videos because it makes me want to drop a ton of money on an aptera 1000 <laughs> maybe i'll sell you mine looks like aptera is building brand recognition now more than ever before in preparation for unveiling the production model at fully charged san diego Ooh, when is fully charged i forget uh, Tesla could show you way more data in their app, but they don't. Kind of sad, like your last drives and your last charges. Yeah, I wish Tesla would show you more. Did I understand correctly that modern cars have to have backup cameras now? Because I think I'd be happy to have a car without a screen at all, but that kind of rule would dash my hopes. I thought I heard that somewhere. I forget who said it, but yeah, I thought I heard someone say that backup cameras had become mandatory. I, I could be wrong. I'm not very well versed in the, the mandatory things for cars. I thought ultrasonic sensors were mandatory. And then Tesla took them off. <laughs> I was like, oh, you can do that? I, I, I just saw so many ultrasonic sensors on cars, I assumed it was a mandate. Um, is BYD's lead over Tesla and EVs delivered really sustained at this point? Last I heard that was just for Q4. Is Q1 numbers... I haven't seen the Q1 numbers, but I know that Tesla was by far in the lead in 2022. BYD was at like a tenth of the number of EVs. And then over the course of two years, BYD grew faster than Tesla was able to grow. So I believe BYD has surpassed them. It's like, it's it's not an easy feat because Tesla is growing pretty fast too. So the fact that BYD was not able to, was not only able to match Tesla, but exceed them in a short amount of time is is crazy. Dude, Milo, I have so many ideas in my head for the four to five passenger Aptera. Oh, I could do a whole video on that, but I kind of, I don't know. I'd probably get carried away with it. I don't have a lot of great rendering skills, so I can't really come up with concept artwork. And I feel bad asking other people to do it for me, but we've talked a little bit about it with Aptera. Just a little, and oh, it gets me so pumped. <laughs> uh, not like a lot. They didn't, you know, they don't have any like prototypes or anything they're sitting on, but they do have like designs and stuff for higher occupancy options. And oh, it's, it literally keeps me up at night in a good way. Like I'm too excited to sleep because <laughs> I've seen some of the, you know, Aptera larger vehicle oh man it's so cool it's so cool um very well i mean you can imagine it's, it's just like any any aptera focused product it's got a big focus on aerodynamics and solar so just picture a four five seater vehicle that has a lot of solar and is super aerodynamic there your brain fills in the gaps. <laughs> we just need more talented render artists. I might need to reach out to some people and say, hey, I'm broke, so I can't pay you, but <laughs> could I could I get your help? I'll shout you out and credit you and everything. Can I, can I get your help designing some of these cool prototypes or 
concept vehicles. Just because I think that's what we need. You know, I, I feel like the main thing is targeting getting enough solar energy on the car to cover the average daily driving habits of people, right? Most people drive 40 miles a day, 30 to 40 miles a day on average. So you just need to make sure you get 30 to 40 miles of range from solar and have a fairly efficient design. So the design, I can't show it to you because I don't have a picture of it. I don't have renders of it or anything, but um, the design I have in my head is kind of, uh, it's kind of like the Honda Saloon, if you guys saw that. It's like you have a seamless dissolve between the frunk and the hood and the windshield. Picture that kind of, uh, where's a good picture? You know how the Aptera has that really narrow nose cone at the front? Instead of it tapering off at the back, it's a bit it's a bit more car-like with four wheels instead of three, but it tapers off, and it tapers off with a really, really long back end. I think um, the design I have in my head that I'm picturing is like basically, basically the height, maybe a little shorter, the height of a Model 3, but the length of like an F-150. Like it's a pretty long stretched out sedan or kind of a wagon, if you will. And the reason it has to be long is to maximize the number of solar cells you can fit on it. And when you make a car longer, it doesn't penalize your aero that much. If you make a car taller, it does. It increases your frontal area. So just like super porpoise looking, like, you know, dolphin fish looking thing that's just absolutely coated with solar cells on the hood, on the dash, on the roof, all the way to the back. Um, and you basically try to double up the solar cells. So the current Aptera has, you know, 500, 700 watts or something like that. If you can fit about 1.5 kilowatts worth of solar and get, you know, maybe seven or eight kilowatt hours a day from that, um, and then the design is aerodynamic enough to achieve about five miles a kilowatt hour. So half of what the three-wheeler can do. It would be more expensive for sure, and it'd be longer. So it would it would probably be a bit more niche in some regards. Definitely cover the back tires for aerodynamic reasons, but try to try to make a really tight turning radius on the front tires because those got to stick out, so you can't really cover them. Um, yeah, you could have a huge... I personally... See, this is the kind of talk I want to have with Aptera. I'd be like, are you guys taking requests? Basically, you want a longer storage capacity in the back. I actually think it could be a third row. I think the key to the next-gen Aptera is kind of blurring the lines between sedan, SUV, and pickup. It's kind of a blurring of all three. Um you make it modular so you can pull the hatch off if you need a full bed. But the back end of it could be a huge storage area or it could be a third row. So you're capable of moving seven people with a vehicle that still gets five, five miles per kilowatt hour. But if you get five miles per kilowatt hour and generate eight kilowatt hours a day from the solar on the car, that means 40 miles of range with a four-wheeled um, but because it's a car, there's more regulation, there's more testing that has to be done. So it'd be more expensive. And of course, five miles per kilowatt hour means bigger battery to get the same range as before. But if you could hit five miles a kilowatt hour, that means a 60 kilowatt hour pack could get you 300 miles. Yeah, it'd be a wagon. I want them to revive the wagon, but I also want it to be a lot more aerodynamic. That's why I'm so excited about that. Um, let me pull up the concept art. Honda says they want to bring this to market. I don't. It, it's a concept, so it'll probably be different in some way, but in a lot of ways. But kind of this design is what I'm thinking about. Super tapered front. I would probably make this a little bit more rounded. Theirs is a lot more flat at the front. I would I would taper it off and curve it a lot more, so it's more like the nose cone of the three wheeled Aptera. But this is close to what I'm envisioning. Come on, why won't it load the whole thing? Yeah, 
really tapered hood and windshield all the way to the back so you can maximize your solar exposure. If you could fit about 1.5 or 1.4 kilowatts of solar on the top and get five miles per kilowatt hour by being short and low to the ground, you could you could be looking at another 40 miles of range per day with a vehicle that's actually capable of sitting five to seven or having a big bed. It's low to the ground, so it's not going to be a great off-roading machine. But um, I know. Doesn't that sound cool? <laughs> wagon is less efficient. Well, it'd be more tapered than a traditional wagon, and it'd have a lot more of a aerodynamic shape at the front. And you'd cover off, you'd cover up the back tires, which they didn't really do with the Honda Saloon. If you had kind of like the GM EV1 and you covered up the back tires, you'd get less aerodynamic penalties from the rims. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of the dream, the dream vehicle I'm picturing. Um, so a 60 kilowatt hour pack to go 300 mile range, and because it's more like a traditional vehicle in terms of its battery pack size. You probably are going to have to use water-cooled uh, or liquid-cooled um, battery management system for the faster charging. Um, I think Aptera should stick to having their vehicles out as separate uh, knockers, basically a longer body with two sets of Aptera wheels, one on front and back. Oh, two sets of Aptera wheels. Oh, that'd be interesting. I don't know. I think when you do four, it might make more aerodynamic sense to tuck them inward three i think you can get away with with the wheel covers because you the problem with the three wheel design is to keep it stable you have to stick them out really far from each other which is what they do currently um, because if you tried to tuck the tires in really close it'd be much more likely to tip over and you couldn't have as aerodynamic as a shape but if you're going to make a bigger vehicle anyway and it's going to have four I don't know. I'd be kind of curious of a four-wheeled outward-mounted position. It'd be very wide, though. <laughs> Aptera's wide enough with the front tires. If the back tires were also that wide, I don't know. That'd be tricky. Um, now you make me want to learn how to do concept rendering. <laughs> uh, that is an Oldsmobile silhouette. Yeah, I think it'd be cool. Um, doesn't much of the aerodynamics of the Aptera come from the body being narrow and wheels projecting out when you want the same for a four-wheeled vehicle? Well, there's, I think the Aptera has figured out the most aerody aerodynamic way to do a three-wheeler, but I don't think it necessarily translates when you do a longer four-wheeler. Um, especially if you occupy more people, there might be some legal issues with trying to keep the outward mounted wheels or the three-wheel design. Um... I think you can I think you can keep the four wheels but still make it very slippery but you also need to maximize your solar exposure which if you're going to have a big wide back end and hatch and everything anyway um I think it makes sense to kind of take take up use of that bed space if you're just shooting for 5 miles a kilowatt hour which is slightly better than my Model 3, it's not like crazy efficiency numbers, then I don't think it would need to look that much different than a typical sedan. We know the Lu uh, Lucid, I think, got five miles a kilowatt hour or close. Um, no, I know it's possible. Um, it's just how big can it get and how much solar can you put on it. But anyway... Monk0651, hope I pronounced that right, says, I just picked up a Model Y yesterday, loving the, new driving, loving the new driving experience. Hey, congratulations. Hope you enjoy it. Hope you like it. With the wheels as separate, the cells, they generate less drag. If the main body is still narrow, overall bullet shape, you'd be more aerodynamic, I think. Well, right now you've only got two of those little crossbars, control arms sticking out, but if you had four, that might change your answer a little bit plus you can still cover up like i said the back tires with the exterior just like the gm ev1 here let me show you what i'm talking about so honda saloon kind of general shape but you can taper it off the back so it comes up a lot just like the current aptera does and then you cover up the back tires like the good tried and true ev1 put a little fit. I'd probably make it 
more aggressive than that fin, but yeah, I would probably make it come down further off the back tire. EV1 was actually very efficient. It was pretty aerodynamic for the time. Um, so I'm basically pitching a combination of the EV1 and the Honda Salute. <laughs> um, I could I could see it being a fairly practical vehicle. I would call it a uh, what do you call it? SPV or a PSV solar practical a practical solar vehicle. Would Aptera potentially be able to make? the rear solar glass retractable like the Cybertruck vault on their next generation four wheel vehicle that I'm not so sure about because most solar cells, you tend to need to make them in these kind of square shapes to be efficient. So I don't think also the vault, the vault cover is cool on the Cybertruck, but it takes up a lot of centrally located space that I think is valuable. So I personally, because I'm a big fan of uh, mid gates, I like being able to fold down the second row and extend your bed length. I wouldn't suggest a. Uh, I wouldn't suggest a vault cover because that kind of kills the hope of a mid gate. But I do think you could make a big solar hatch that is disconnectable. There's just a few tools. Aptera's right to repair, so they would want to make it easy for you to just unhook it, unplug the solar connectors, take the hatch off, leave it in the garage, and then you've got a big open bed. It's not going to be good for your aero, but if you're just moving stuff around town. Um, it'd be fine. And then if you want the hatch on there, you can reinstall it and plug it back in and keep your aerodynamic shape. I don't know. A lot of the safety baked into the Aptera design comes from that rounded F1 fuselage shape. Don't think you'd be able to maintain that without the side projected wheels. Well, if it's bigger, I think you could. It's a crumple zone. We have very, very safe four-wheel vehicles now. I don't think it would suddenly become less, less safe. Think of the crumple zone on their current nose cone. That still works. I might also mount the, because it's such a long vehicle, I might put the occupants kind of over the front axle. It might feel a little weird when you're driving it, but if it's in the name of efficiency, people might get used to it. Um, anyway, I've been live for a while. I could talk about this all day. Fun stuff, exciting stuff, efficiency unlocks all kinds of practicality, but I appreciate you all for tuning in and watching and supporting the channel. Sorry I didn't answer all of Sunny Patel's questions. He, oh, his last question. Will you do a video on FSD version 12 on Auto Park if I get it? Yes, of course. I'll do all kinds of videos if I get the free FSD month. Hopefully I do. But thank you all for tuning in. Hope you have an excellent rest of your day. Bye-bye.